Welcome to the ICC Nairobi podcast, where we are all about raising godly generations. We're so glad you're here, and we believe that wherever you're listening to us from, this word will bless and minister to you. Uh, We serve a God who is so faithful, a God who is so good. And uh, as we pause in his presence this morning, I believe that he desires to speak uh, to each one of us. You know, when I thought about this day and the men leading us, uh, there seems to be this battle, this battle for defining what manhood is, uh, what manhood should be. Uh, there seems to be this tension of who a man truly is. And when I think about the society that we live in, we tend to relate with men more because of what they have rather than who they are. We relate with men more out of what they have rather than who they are. I woke up this morning thinking about uh, a scripture that I'm going to read as a kickoff. I was reading reading through Ecclesiastes uh, this week. And so there's a scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 13. And this is just, you know, my own reflection for this week out of my quiet time. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and from verse 13. The word of God says, I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. It says in verse 14, there was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise. A man poor but wise. And he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. And I thought about it, that those words are so true, that we relate with men more out of what they have than who they are. And a lot of times the tension that we have in our society is mainly because we have men who are absent, or they are present, but they are passive or men who have absconded their responsibilities. I think for me, it's always a joy when I see men serve in in church, when I see men serve in our kids' spaces, because our children then are able to grow up seeing men serving God. They're able to see a model of what it looks like to serve God. That's why it's so important for us in our homes, as fathers, that we are godly models to our children. I always say there's what you can teach, and then there's what is caught. Our children catch what we do, what we say. They catch more from us in our actions than in anything else. But I've discovered that most men struggle. Most men struggle with never feeling enough. Most men struggle with never feeling enough in a world that is constantly asking for more. It seems as if no matter what you do, no matter what you give, it's never enough. And so the world around us is always asking us, asking us for more toys, more cars, more symbols of power and authority, more time. It always seems as if we can never give enough time. And there's attention because you want to be the provider for the family. There's attention because if you give more time, there's a tendency that you may not be able to provide as much as you want to. There's always the quest for us to provide more time, to provide more resource to uplift the quality of our families. There is a demand on men to be fit, you know, uh, to be in good shape. There's a demand of how we relate, even in our own relationships. And the world has given us this image of a macho man. And that image is what is imposed on us as men. And it's a stereotype. It's a stereotype of how a perceived successful man is supposed to be. And the pursuit of that stereotype is killing so many men. Because we've defined success for men. We've we've defined a successful man as one who drives a nice car, lives in a nice neighborhood, is probably married with two or three kids. He's educated. He probably has a master's degree. We've defined a successful man as one who, as I said, is physically fit, works out, probably goes to the gym. 
we've defined an image of how a successful man is supposed to be. But the challenge with how the culture defines a successful man is that the culture also says that a successful man is in touch with his feminine side. And I find myself asking, you know, there's something wrong with that statement. How can a successful, thriving man be in touch with his feminine side? We expect a man to be tough, tough enough to fight for us, yet soft enough to cry with us when we are crying. That he's available to spend time with his family, yet he works hard enough to maintain a lavish lifestyle. We live in a society where a successful man, a thriving man, is expected to be in a relationship, a committed relationship, but also will probably have a platonic relationship on the side with a woman that he is not married to. And that is the kind of picture that the society is giving us. And the challenge is that all of us are buying into that lie. All of us are buying into that image of who a man is supposed to be. A man who is successful is supposed to be able to take his family out for holidays. Maybe take them out of the country to Dubai or Durban. Be able to pay school fees at these high-end private schools. The world tells us that a successful, thriving man, that he drinks a little. He drinks a little just to socialize. But he's able to maintain soberness and behave in the required way. And the challenge is that this image of who a man is supposed to be is being sold to all of us, and we are buying into this lie. Many of us as men do not fully understand the identity of who God has made us to be. We don't understand who God has created us to be. We don't understand our identity in God. We don't understand our place, our place in this world, the purpose for which God created us. And so rather than being custodians of God's creation, we take advantage of what God has placed around us. We are always chasing, chasing this higher high. We're always chasing after the next, after the next thing. We are chasing after this thing that has eluded us. And as much as we ourselves struggle to understand where we are and who we are and where we are going, the women around us also struggle to relate with us. They struggle to understand us. They struggle to understand us, especially when we are silent. Because for a lot of men, a lot of the times, we are silent. When a man is overwhelmed, how they process through the tension is so different from how a woman processes through the tension. When a woman is under pressure, they talk about it. They will talk to their friends. They will talk to the people that are around them. They will talk about it. Not because they're looking for a solution, which is what I thought when I got married. <laughs> I thought every time my wife would talk to me about an issue, she was looking for me to fix it. And so for a number of years, I attended to be her chief fixer. Whatever challenge she spoke about, I would give her a solution. When she's having an issue in the office, I would offer a quick solution. When she's having an issue out of the family, I would offer, I would be quick to offer a solution. And then I would ask myself, why is she mad that I'm offering her a solution? Shouldn't she be graciously receiving these words of wisdom from her husband? You see, we process through challenges differently. A woman wants to speak about it. But a man will often recede into an inner place of silence. Sometimes we call it a cave. And the problem is that in that place of silence, the people that are around us become so frustrated. The women that are around us are frustrated. They are frustrated because they have no idea what we are going through. They have no idea what's going on on the inside. We go into these moments of silence, and it seems as if there's nothing that anyone around us can do to draw us out. And for the ladies who are here, if each one of them had an opportunity, they would confess that they have had a moment in their lives when a man in their life went silent, and they didn't know what to do. There could be some even right now where you're going through a period where you, the man in your life is silent, and you don't know what to do. Maybe some would say they were silent when I was expecting them to propose. They were silent. 
They are silent when the bills remain unpaid. The bills are due, but they are silent. They are silent in a moment of crisis when we expect them to do something. Men are silent. Silent when we expect them to speak out. Silent when we expect them to act, do something. But men are silent. Men are silent in a world that is seeking for answers. A world that is so desperate for answers. When we don't know what to do, we go into this place of silence. Years ago, many, many years ago, a friend of mine lost his job. It took his wife almost six months to figure out that this man had lost his job. Because he would still wake up in the morning and dress up and go to work, as he always would. And in the evening, he would come back. But then they started getting behind on the bills and meeting their needs. And she kept wondering what's going on. Until one day, she couldn't reach him. And she called the office, only for the person on the other side to let her know that her husband had not been working in that place for months. You see, when men are overwhelmed, when we don't know what to do, we go into this place of silence. And the world around us detaches from us. But what I have also discovered as I talk to men and I spend time with men, I've discovered that men in their silence are suffering. The men in their silence are struggling. That in our silence, there are so many battles that we are fighting. That for some of us, we are confronted by the consequences of the past we have lived. And we are unable to deal with the issues of our past. For some of us, we are overwhelmed by the present condition, the challenges that we face in the moment. While for some of us, it's the bondage of fear. This place of bondage of fear. The fear of what the future holds. And so we are either struggling with our past, things that we've never gotten out of, or we are caught up in the moment, and we are overwhelmed in the moment, and we are unable to move forward. Or sometimes it's the fear of the future. The challenges that we see, that we anticipate in the life that is ahead of us. Yet in all this, we forget. We forget something that is so important. We forget that manhood is a gift. Manhood is a gift. Manhood is a gift. That it's a gift to have a man around you. Even as a man, it's a gift to have another fellow man around you. As a woman, it's a gift to have a man around you. Whether they are a father, a brother, whether they are a husband, in whichever form, it's a gift to have the presence of a man in our lives. And we need to understand that that we walk out of a place where we appreciate the men that are in our lives. Because we live in a world that beats down on men and doesn't celebrate who men are. We live in a world that tears down men. A world that constantly says to men, you are not good enough. And so we need to build a culture of celebrating and appreciating the men that are around us. There is one amen at the front here. <laughs> As a wife, one of the best gifts you can give to your husband is to let him know that you appreciate what he does for that family. As a son, as a daughter, one of the best gifts you can give to your father is to let them know that you appreciate them, that they're a blessing to you, whether it's your son or your brother. And I want to challenge you today that you would reach out to a man around you and let them know that they're a blessing to you. Let them know that they're a blessing and a gift. So how do we deal with the silence of man? How do we recover from this place of bondage? How do we move past our past mistakes? How do we confront the challenges of the present? How do we face an uncertain future? And I believe that the key is in going back to who God made us to be. Because God has made us as his sons and daughters. God has created us as his sons and daughters. That God has made us male and female. And we must remember in a society that is consumed by the message of equality, we must remember that men and women are created to function differently. We are created to function differently. And there is something that God has deposited in each one of us that we need from each other. 
So if you go back to the garden, the garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, we go back to the garden, and there we meet with the first man. Genesis chapter 2. If you read verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then God said, the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And so you see God creating man, and then God puts man in the garden. When you look at the phrase that is used there, of how God put man in the garden, how he placed man in the garden, it actually means that he placed man in the garden to be at rest in the garden. The literal meaning is that God put man in the garden for man to be at rest in the garden. That was God's intention, that man would live in intimacy with him. That man would live in the presence of God. That was God's desire. And so we must remember that in a world that challenges us to be driven, God calls us to be present in his presence and at rest in him. And so God gave man the garden as his permanent and settled dwelling. He gave man this garden, that this garden would be the place where man would dwell. But he also gave him a responsibility. He gave him a responsibility to tend the garden. So he had a role to play. It wasn't just for him to be at rest in this paradise. But man had a responsibility to actually care for this garden. And we have to understand that the work of tending the garden was actually a work of joy. It was a work of joy that would add to the happiness of man. The garden responded willingly to the efforts of man as it had not yet been cast. And so the work was to be a joy, a delight. And man was to be responsible for caring over this, over this garden. And so we must understand that work is not a curse. Before the fall of man, work was for his pleasure and recreation. That the God who created us also created something for us to work on. The God who made us also made something for us to work on. But also you have to realize that without man's intervention, the garden around him would become wild and degenerate. So God put him in this garden, and then he gave him a responsibility. Say to him, tend the garden. And if man did not play his role, then the garden would become wild. It would degenerate. But I've discovered that that is also so true in the world that we live in today. That when a man is absent, when a man does not play his part in the lives of the people that are around him, that then the people around him the things that are around him, begin to take a different path than that which God intended for it to be under his leadership and direction. That when a man is not present and engaged, then there are things that begin to go wrong around him, which God has made him to be able to intervene and actually raise. 
But God doesn't stop there. He goes ahead and he instructs man. He says to man, eat from every tree. Eat from every tree in the garden. But you're forbidden to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord said to man, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. So he places him in the garden. He has access to everything. But he puts around him margins. He puts around him some guardrails. He puts around him some instructions of how he should live. And I've come to the conclusion that men thrive. All of us, we thrive when we live within the margins that God has created for us. That all of us thrive. That we find meaning, fulfillment, and purpose when we live within the boundaries that God has set around us. God established some margins in the garden. He established some boundaries. And I believe that as we go through life, it's so important that you and I ask ourselves, what are the margins within which God has called us to live? What are the boundaries within which God has called us to focus our lives? You see, those margins dictate that God is the one who is at the center and that we adopt a lifestyle of worship. We adopt a lifestyle where God is at the center, where God is elevated more than anything else where the greatest desire of our hearts is to do the will of God in our lives. God has put margins around us, but God desires that you and I, that the greatest desire of our hearts will be to live out his will in our lives. So man is created to live in the presence of God. But I find that it's so easy for us to spend our lives moving farther and farther away from who God has called us to be. We are created to be dependent fully on God. But we live lives where we constantly seek our independence. So rather than growing independence, dependence on God, we pursue our own independence. We want to be independent to live our own lives. It's like the prodigal son in Luke 15 who says to the father, you are no longer of value to me. All that I need is my inheritance. And so we pursue a life where we desire independence. And it leads us away, farther and farther away from God. Man is created to be dependent on God, to live in intimacy with him. Sometimes you'll hear people say, I'm a self-made man. And ask myself, what part of self-made have we contributed? Because really all that we are is by the grace and favor of God upon our lives. And so my question to you is, how are you tending your garden? Are there weeds in your garden? Are you staying within the margins, the guardrails that God has established for you? Is the deepest desire of your heart to seek the will of God and to walk in obedience to the will of God in your life. Because when the will of God is our pursuit, then everything else has proper perspective around it. Eventually we read about the creation of the woman and God creates the woman to be a helper to the man. It's not the man who goes to God and says, I'm so lonely, I need someone in my life. It's God who sees a need for companionship. And he makes the woman out of the man. God declares it is not good for man to be alone. He says I will make a suitable helper for him. And I found that one of the greatest challenges that men face, apart from their silence, is their isolation. That sometimes men can be so isolated that a man can be going through a crisis and yet no one around them has any idea. And I really believe that men need companions, that God has made the woman to be a helper. But men also need relationships around them with other men that are accountability relationships, that are places of fellowship and authenticity and vulnerability. I used to be so big on accountability 
and how men need accountability. But you know what I discovered is that accountability without vulnerability does not work. That if accountability is going to work, then there has to be a sense of vulnerability. And it's not just for men, it's for all of us. That we need a relationships of accountability around us, but we have to choose to be vulnerable. And so the Lord says, this man needs a helper. I don't want him to live in isolation. Man is created to live and thrive in community with others. And I want to challenge you, especially the men who are here, that this doesn't just become a place that you come and then you go, but that you find some genuine friendship and fellowship. And that's one of the gifts that I've had over the years, that God has enabled me to build some amazing relationships of men that I love and I know they love me. And I want to challenge all of us that we would be open to relationship and accountability. And so the woman comes into the life of the man to be a helper, not to compete with the man, but to be a companion to the man. And I have to pause and say that we are living in a culture now where there's so much competition between the men and the women that even in a marriage, there can be competition between the husband and the wife. And sometimes what I see is there's no problem when the husband is doing well and thriving. But the moment when the tables turn, then there's a tension that comes into the relationship. But can we commit ourselves as sons and daughters of Most High King to be those who look beyond issues of finances and positions and titles and to come to the place where we relate out of a place of a genuine and conditional love with one another? You know, for most of our married life, my wife has always earned more than I did. When we got married, I think her salary, her pay was maybe three times what my pay was. But I don't remember a single day when my wife says, say to me, who brings the bigger check to this home? She always earned more until seven years ago when God spoke to her about stepping down from her role. My wife always out earned me. How is it that the money, the positions and the titles are becoming such a point of tension in our relationships? And it's not just about how the women relate with the men. It's also about the men. How do we as men relate with our spouses when they are thriving in their career? Do we come alongside them to cheer them, to champion them? Or do we begin now to put boundaries on what they can and cannot do? I believe that God puts us in each other's lives to be able to become champions and cheerleaders. That you look at your spouse and you see this man, this woman, that is a son of God, a daughter of the Most High God, and God has entrusted them to you. And so it's not for you to compete them. It's not for you to fight them. It's about how can you be a champion? How can you be a cheerleader? How can you help them to become all that God has made them, created them to be? And I want to pause here and say to the men in this house that one of the best things you can give, those who are watching online, one of the best things you can give to your spouse is to empower them. Empower your wife. Empower your spouse. Empower them. Seek the best for them. Open doors for them. Allow them to become all that God has called them to be. But we know the story of what happens in the garden. The God brings the woman, but then the serpent comes and deceives the woman. The serpent deceives the woman by sowing a seed of doubt. And the serpent simply says to the woman, did God really say? Did God really say? You see, the devil still whispers. The devil still whispers to us. The devil still whispers and says, did God really call you? Did God really speak to you about that issue? Has God really promised you? Has God really spoken over that matter? Did God really, did God really say? And the devil sows a seed of doubt. And the woman looks at the fruit and the word of God tells us that it was good for food pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. Good for food. 
pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. And so what does she do? She eats of the fruit, and then she gives it to the man. The Bible says the man who was with her. But theologians argue. They argue about that statement. Some of them argue and say, was it that he was within the same geographical area? Was it that he was within the same physical area? Theologians argue whether he was really there when the serpent was being deceived or whether he was just around the corner when the, when the woman was being deceived. And so there's all, there's all this argument. But for me, when I read through that portion of scripture, what I see is that there was a man who was present. He is the one who had received the instructions. And in that moment when the woman eats of the fruit, he also partakes of the fruit. Maybe also Adam had been looking longingly at the fruit, <laughs> waiting for an opportunity to have a bite. That is theology according to me, myself, and I. <laughs> Maybe he had just been longing for the fruit. He was waiting, desiring. And the woman just gives him an excuse. The same way Sarah says to Abraham, we are growing old. Why don't you take my servant, my slave girl, and let's have a baby, let's have a child. We've waited for this promise for too long. And what does Abraham do? He takes the slave girl. Maybe he had been quietly admiring this girl. <laughs> Again, theology according <laughs> to me. But we see a man who gives in, gives in to that moment. And when the Lord comes into the garden, he says, we realize we were naked and we hid. And then he says, this woman that you gave me, this woman that you gave me. I don't know if you've ever heard that statement. This woman that you gave me. Maybe what you've heard is this man that God gave me. This person that God brought into my life. And a culture is established that becomes a culture of pushing blame rather than taking responsibility. I find that in our moments of crisis, it's easier for us to push blame than to take responsibility. It's easy for us to look for someone to blame. And so you begin to see a series of decisions. When you look at Cain and Abel, Cain is jealous, envious, kills the brother. When God asks him, he says, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? You see Abraham, and he would go and give his wife away to the king. But then he would justify himself and say, she is my sister. She's only my sister. You think about Isaac, and Isaac would work, and he would be waiting. But you see all these patterns that begin to be established along the way. You look at the life of Jacob. And Jacob would live this life of betrayal until he comes to a point where now he's confronted by God. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 32, Jacob has lived this lie. He's lived a life of a lie where he's lied his way, he's tried to find his way. And he comes in Genesis 32 and from verse 22, he meets with God. The word of God tells us that night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female slaves, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. 
Then Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So Jacob steps into this moment where he's all alone, and it is just him and his God. And he's confronted by this battle, and he has to fight and wrestle. He wrestles with this man. Every human being, each one of us, will at some point in our lives face a dark night of the soul. Each one of us will come into a moment where we'll be all alone, confronted by a battle. When everything that you know is insufficient to get you to the other side. And when those moments come, I want to challenge you to hold on. To hold on to your faith and identity in God. I want to challenge you to hold on. In that moment, Jacob is forced to confront his past and the identity he has carried up until that moment. And God says to him, you will no longer be called Jacob. You will no longer be called a trickster, a cheater. You will no longer be called a trickster. I will give you a new name. One who struggles with God. One who struggles with God. And in that moment, what Jacob came to discover as he received the blessing was that God had a future for him. God had a future for him. And I want to say to you, you could be here today, maybe you're in a battle in your marriage. It could be a battle in your work. It could be a battle with your health. Maybe just with where you are in life, you're battling with an issue with a child, your son or daughter, you're battling with your sense of calling. Maybe you've been on this road for so long and now you're questioning everything you've ever thought and believed. I want to say to you that God knows you. God knows your name. God knows your past. But beyond that, God has a future for you. God has a future for you. God has a future for you. How many men will still be alive today if they knew that God had a future for them? How many marriages will still be standing today if they knew that God had a future for them? How many people that gave up would still be standing if they knew that God had a future for them? As you walk the journey of life, I pray that you would have a sense of confidence that God has a future for you. That God knows you. He knows the details of your life. That God has loved with an unconditional love. So what should our posture be in response? I believe that our posture should be one where we are present. We are present in God's presence. We are engaged. We are willing to let our voice be heard. That as men, we are willing to provide leadership and direction for your family. There's some of you here, your wives, your families are crying out to you for you to lead. Would you step up and be the man that God has called you to be? Be the man that God has called you to be. Be the man, the woman God has called you to be. That we would stop hiding behind our weakness. And that would allow God to bring healing. That we would have a posture where we are broken before God. Because when we are broken before God, it allows for healing and restoration to take place. Brokenness opens the door for healing and restoration to take place. That we are not called to walk in isolation. As a man, as a woman, as a child of God, we are not called to walk in isolation. But we are called to be in community. And the ask that we make of you as part of ICC is that you would be part of a small group. You would be part of an awake group. You would be part of a community group as a man. You would be part of some fellowship of men, of women, where you have people that are around you that are praying for you. Our posture should be one where we take responsibility, even for the mistakes we have made, and we learn to surrender to God and to ask him to minister to us. The other day I was looking at the statistics, and statistics tell us 
that there are four times more men that take their own lives than women. We need to find a place of community. Speak out, talk about what we are going through, the challenges we are faced with. Because help is not too far. God has a future for us. We have to be willing to let go of the past. A lot of the times the battles we fight are the issues of our past, the unresolved pain of our past. A relationship with a father that pained us. A relationship with a mother that pained us. A relationship with someone that we trusted, that took advantage of us. And we carry the heart and the pain. I pray that you would find healing. That you would find healing because heart people heart people. The heart that we carry in our hearts becomes a point of pain for those that are around us. I want to challenge you. If there are issues in your past that you would let go of the pain of the past and embrace the future that God has for you. That you would let go and embrace the future that God has for you. You see, if we are to thrive in our relationships, then we must go back to the identity of who God has called us to be. I always think about Jesus at the point of baptism. And Jesus has not yet performed any miracles. But God the Father speaks over him. When you read in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, the Father speaks over his son. And he declares those words that each one of us needs to hear. He says to Jesus, you are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And I believe that each one of us needs to hear those words spoken over us. That the Lord would say over you, this is my son, this is my daughter, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And so I want to invite us into a moment of communion. And we have some elements. We have the bread and the cup. And if you're watching us online, you can join us. You can get some bread, maybe some juice. And if we can just go into this moment of communion, and as we step into this moment of communion, I believe that God wants to meet with you at his table. That you would meet with him. And God wants to meet with you at his table that you in turn would meet with him. That as we prepare the bread and the cup, that you'd open your heart before him. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. But I know, I know that God is with you. I know that God has a future for you. I want to invite you in the next few moments if you could just open your hands and open your heart and just go before God as your father and surrender to him. Surrender your life to him. Just open your hands, open your heart and go before our God and surrender to him. Ask him to meet with you. Ask him to bring healing to your broken places. That you will take a moment this morning. Maybe you have carried so many burdens with you. Maybe there's been such a desperation. Maybe you feel so overwhelmed by the things of life. But you are so desperate that you would surrender to him. That you would surrender to him. I surrender to him. Could be in your marriage, your battling. Could be in your family. That you would surrender to him. Maybe your heart has been drawn so far away from God. Maybe you have issues you've gone through in your past, you've been unable to move on. You just open your heart. Open your heart. Just open your heart. Say, Lord, here I am. And I need you. I need you. I need you this morning. Lord, I need you. Lord, we come into your presence this morning. And Father, we confess that we need you. Lord, we need you. As fathers, we need you. As husbands, we need you. As sons, we need you. As mothers, as wives, as sisters, Lord, we need you. 
As daughters, we need you. Father, we need you. And open our eyes beyond the stereotypes of this world. Help us to see who you have called us to be. You have called us to be mighty, mighty men and mighty women. You've called us to be victorious. Lord, you've called us to be men and women of purpose. I pray that you would visit with us today, that we would have an encounter with you this morning. Open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear you. Lord, minister healing. Minister restoration. Restore that marriage. Restore that family. Restore the broken pieces of our hearts. Where there is hopelessness, Lord, I speak a new hope today. In the name of Jesus. You could be here this morning. You're watching us online. But you have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord over your life. The beginning of living a victorious life is when you and I accept Jesus Christ as Lord of our life. If that's your cry, would you slip up your hand where you are? You would say, I want to start over this morning. I want to start over this morning. My heart has been drawn so far away. I want to start over this morning. If that is you, would you slip up your hand where you are? Say, I'm starting over today. Starting over today. Let's believe together. Let's pray this prayer. Say with me, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love. You died on the cross for me. You shed your blood that I would receive forgiveness. I confess I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I choose you now as Lord over my life. I surrender all to you. In Jesus' name. First Corinthians in chapter 11 the word of God tells us in verse 23 for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread together. Let's partake of the cup together. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we adore you. As we sit at your table, minister healing, minister restoration. You are here and you would say, you know what, I'm going through a season of pain. I feel overwhelmed. I'd say, I need God this morning. Maybe it's heart that has come out of a relationship. Maybe just the space that you're in, you feel abandoned and alone. If that's your cry, I would love to pray for you before we close. Would you rise up on your feet? You've gone through a season of pain. You feel abandoned and overwhelmed. Would you stand? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning. We thank you because we are not fatherless this morning. We have a father. You are our father. I pray, O oh God, that you would reveal yourself to us. Open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear you. But above that, I pray for my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I pray that you would bring healing, that you would bring restoration. I pray that you would lift the cloud of sorrow. You would lift the cloud of grief and that you would do a new work in them. I pray that today would mark a new beginning, a new beginning in their life, in their journey with you. Today would mark a new beginning, that you would intervene on their behalf, that you would make a way where there seems to be no way. As they came into your house today, they shall not live the same way they came. And that open doors would be their portion. 
the glory and honor of your name. We worship you and we exalt you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Let's celebrate the goodness of God. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information about ICC Nairobi, you can follow us on all our social media platforms, that is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at ICC underscore Nairobi or our website, iccnairobi.org. Be sure to subscribe and share this podcast with your family and friends. Until next time.